Wichita Liberty TV, featuring host Bob Weeks. Local politics without the spin. Interviews with nationally respected economists. Hear directly from Kansas conservatives about what matters to you. It's individual liberty, limited government, and free markets. Wichita Liberty TV. Hello, I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV, your weekly source for news, analysis, and commentary about Kansas and Wichita government and public affairs. Broadcast on Great Plains Television, that's channel 26.1, Sunday mornings at 8.30, repeated again at 4.30 in the afternoon. Also, on the Voice for Liberty at wichitaliberty.org on the internet there, you'll find uh, my site with show notes for this episode and all the other episodes of Wichita Liberty TV also, a lot of other material there at wichitaliberty.org. Uh, with me this week, of course, Carl Peter John and our special guest, Keen Umber. He's an attorney from Alma, soon to be uh, Wichita now, but uh, he's been working in and following the criminal justice system in Kansas for some time, and there are quite a few issues that deserve discussion. So, uh, Keen, welcome to Wichita Liberty TV. Thank you. Thank you and one bill that's been working its way through the legislature this year involves compensation of prisoners. So this, if, if I understand, uh, would pay people who have been convicted, but then later were able to prove their innocence, it would pay them some money. Well, yes, and, and you know, it's, it's better than nothing, the bill is. But, and so I don't want to disparage the bill then, but uh, if you get wrongfully convicted uh, of a crime and you spend time in jail, they're willing to pay $80,000 a year mm -hmm. compensation. That's not an insignificant amount of money, but uh, when you break it down to the hours uh, spent in jail, that's $9.13 an hour. Mm -hmm. Hardly payment for you know, being denied your liberty, denied uh, your family, your job, the destruction that's done to your life wrongfully. So, you know, it got sent eventually to the uh, Judicial Council for study. I hope it gets to be, uh, the compensation would, would be more than that, showing that, uh, you know, an actual compensation for the harm done would be a lot more than 80,000. In some other states that have this type of law, it's quite a bit more, isn't it? Or Well, I, I don't know what uh, Texas is the one that comes to mind. Uh, last year, if I, my information is correct, they spent $93 million on compensating wrongfully convicted people. And I think the fiscal note for this bill in Kansas just said maybe a couple million dollars or something they thought the cost of it would be in Kansas. Well, God bless Sean Sullivan, but, uh, you know, I don't think he's... Uh, aware the Bledsoe case uh, that's going through the federal courts now he's suing for 15 mm -hmm. uh, million uh, Eddie Lowry from Manhattan sued for 12 got 10 they settled on 7.5 million so uh, and there's a there's a lot of other wrongfully convicted people not just of murder and, and the serious capital offenses but drug offenses and, and when and another problem with the bill is where we're not correcting the problem compensating wrongfully convicted people on that end, we need to go back and say, why are they wrongfully convicted in the first place? Well, it's going to be either, you know, poor defense counsel, ineffective assistance of counsel, but more likely it's prosecutorial misconduct, where prosecutors hide evidence, fail to disclose evidence, and not all prosecutors, I don't want to paint with a wide brush, but there are some prosecutors that will actually manufacture evidence. And we, the bill is a great opportunity to address those things. And we address those things by removing the statutory absolute immunity that's granted to prosecutors. And once we remove that, they should have qualified immunity like everyone else, and when they commit a crime, then they can be civilly prosecuted. When you're talking about prosecutorial misconduct, are we talking here about strictly state prosecutors or state and federal, or federal prosecutors primarily? How would you break that down? between? Because there's a big difference there, as you, I think right. you well know. If you're practicing law in Kansas, then you're under the Kansas Rules of uh, Professional Procedure. Mm -hmm. And uh, you violate one of those rules, I don't care whether you're federal or state, uh, you have to be held accountable for that. And uh, in 2016, September 27th, I think it was, uh, the Kansas Supreme Court passed State v. Sherman, or came to a decision on State v. Sherman, and it was a murder case and they affirmed the conviction, but this particular case laid out uh, the changes that the courts have illustrated, uh, put forth regarding prosecutorial misconduct. You had to prove three elements, 
gross and flagrant uh, uh, misconduct, that the misconduct was material, and the old law was you had to show um, that the prosecutor held uh, ill will towards the defendant. Well, after Sherman in, in September, uh, they removed the ill will because it was subjective. You couldn't really ever prove that. That's why they never got it. And these are, these, uh, we're now back to the federal standard, what the U.S. Supreme Court decided in a whole host of cases. And the rule now in Kansas is when a judge sees a prosecutor has made a, a gross and flagrant error, it was material, the Sherman case instructs the judges to stop the case right then and there, hold the prosecutor accountable, set a date for which he or she is going to have to go before uh, the judge on a uh, show cause hearing on why that prosecutor should not be uh, prosecuted for uh, contempt of court. Because unless, and the judges kind of, Siegel wrote the opinion, his unanimous opinion, but judges are the captain of the courtroom. They're not just uh, an appendage on, uh, I think we had a, a case down here in Wichita just recently that got decided where a judge actually fell asleep and the court decided, well, you, know, you can't get a fair trial when the judge is asleep. The judges are the captain. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to wait for a defense counsel to actually object. The judge is supposed to say, wait a minute, what you said is not true. It's not true by a long shot. Oh, very good. So. Let's take a moment off for a commercial break. When we come back, we'll continue talking with Keen Umber about the Kansas criminal justice system. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks with Carl Peter John and our guest this week, Keen Umber. Um, so does the federal system, if you're wrongly convicted in a, of a federal crime and you're able to prove your innocence, do they pay compensation? Well, uh, my knowledge of the federal system isn't uh, too extensive. I, I know that there was a case down in Texas where the man was wrongfully convicted and got I don't know, 118 million. It goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court reverses the, the ruling saying that you had to show a pattern and practice of that prosecutor's misconduct. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very difficult to do. Um, but the Sherman case instructs us through a whole host of U.S. Supreme Court cases that the defense counsel would be malpractice if they don't file an ethical complaint with a disciplinary administrator's office about that prosecutorial misconduct that occurred. And defense counsels are businessmen too. They don't want to file a complaint against the prosecutor. They're going to have to see time and time and time again for fear they're not going to get a, uh, a charitable plea deal. Mm -hmm. But I'm not built that way. And I think many defense counsels think that uh, that those kind of defense counsels that are just protecting their uh, relationship with the prosecutor, notwithstanding their misconduct, uh, they're, they're committing misconduct too because there's an ethical rule that says if I know another lawyer has committed misconduct, I'm duty bound to report him mm -hmm. or her. And if I don't, the one can be filed against me. So, Wow. Kind of the honor system, I guess. How, as a practical matter, if you're wrongly convicted, if you're in the prison at Hutchinson or uh, El Dorado, wherever, how difficult as a practical matter is it to prove that you are innocent of the actual crime for which you were convicted? Well, it is a very high bar. Uh, Midwest Innocence Project in the Bledsoe case up in Holton uh, filed a, a, a motion to, you know, retest a rape kit that was never tested at the beginning of the, of the case. Bledsoe spent 16 years in jail for killing his niece and raping and killing his niece. And uh, they had a rape kit all along, way back then and they never tested it. So the Midwest Innocence Project got involved and put that uh, motion before Judge Nafsinger, and I think it was a long time, I'm gonna say about a year before he acted on that motion. And so he finally agreed, said, well, if, it's, if we test it and it's Floyd Bledsoe's, it's just gonna be another nail in the coffin. If it's not, uh, we, we've got a wrongful conviction here. Well, they tested it and it wasn't, as we all know now, it was his brother, Tom Bledsoe that actually committed the, the rape and murder, and mm -hmm. Tom, after that news came out, committed suicide um, shortly thereafter and left notes confessing that what he did and showed him a map where the, the shell casing was that proved that he actually had done it, so mm -hmm. it's difficult. As opposed to an individual case, let, let me ask you, you mentioned Texas has compensation uh, of, of some nature. How many other states, do you, out of the other uh, 48 states, 
um, would have some type of compensation like you're talking about here, and are any of them neighboring neighbors of Kansas? You know, that I don't know the answer. I know, uh, and, and I, I will find out the answer, and another parents I'll have that data uh, because I think it's a good information to have to show where are we at in that uh, spectrum. Are, are we are we one of Ten states that don't have a compensation, or we won a 43. You know, I, I don't know, but I will find that information out. And I think you've also come across cases I know where the people are convicted, and the prosecutors they just didn't simply make a mistake, and they weren't. It wasn't just that they were overzealous, but they actually committed what should be crimes or are crimes, and um, were. Well, I don't know exactly how to phrase the question, but uh, Dana Chandler case comes to mind. Yes, Dana Chandler was convicted of a double homicide in 2012 that actually occurred uh, July 7, 2002. And uh, the Supreme Court held oral arguments in that case uh, January 23, 2016. I know it's been a year. And the, uh, the Supreme Court uh, challenged the prosecutor, a lady by the name of Jackie Spradling, with five instances of misconduct that were just absolute uh, egregious. I mean, they were. Uh, well, one of them that comes to mind was uh, Ms. Spradling said in closing arguments, and she wrote it in her brief and actually argued uh, to the Kansas Supreme Court that the victim got a protection from abuse order against Dana Chandler. And so when I think it was Judge uh, Justice Johnson asking me, he says, where would I find that in the record? And she says, well, if you're going to limit me the record, I can't point to it. He said, well, then it's not evidence. And he says, you can't say things that aren't true. Well, they keep pressuring on this point, and finally, Ms. Spradling says, well, I don't want to mislead this court. There is no PFA. And then Justice John says, even though you said there was? Yes. And then there's four other things. There's actually 17 of those things. We've got them documented uh, all out. And uh, You've got a big PFA. Uh, protection from abuse order. So okay. she lied about this, mm -hmm. the prosecutor did, because she thought it would strengthen her case. Right. That, and she said in closing arguments that uh, Michael Sisko, the victim, went to a judge, said, Judge, you got to help me, you got to protect me, uh, this lady's crazy. And so he got the order, and she said Dana Chandler just blew right through it when she went in and killed him. But none of that is true, not even remotely true. And mm -hmm. what's the status of the prosecutor today? Is she um, still working for the Shawnee District Attorney's Office? July 27th, I filed an ethics case against uh, Ms. Spradling. Uh, and then October 3rd, she resigned. And the case is actually being held by uh, Assistant DA down here, Ron Pasquale. And he is operating as investigator for the District, for the Disciplinary Administrator Association. So, I mean, I haven't heard one way or the other where that ethics case is. But Ms. Spradling is actually working for Allen County Assistant as an assistant prosecutor now. Wow, okay. Well, that's uh, really troubling, but we will take another moment off. I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks with Carl Peter John and attorney Keen Umber. Uh, related to criminal justice and everything, there's something called civil asset forfeiture. Forfeiture. This is something I've been involved in. I even traveled to Topeka and offered testimony before a, a committee of the House of Representatives this year. It has to do with if you're arrested for a crime, maybe you don't even have to be arrested, but um, if the police think you used your car or something in the commission of what they think you committed a crime, they seize the car, they keep it, maybe they sell it, whatever they do, they don't give it back to you. And it's a very difficult process to get your property back even if you were uh, acquitted or no charges were ever brought. That's it's true. And, and civil forfeiture, they always give it a nice label. It, it should be um, civil theft because that's what it is. There's a complete denial of due process when the police officer stops somebody and see some cash and then immediately can look at the person and conclude that person shouldn't have that much cash. It must be uh, proceeds of criminal activity and therefore we're going to seize it. Uh, if it was criminal forfeiture, then they, they got to suffer, the, go through the trial, be found guilty and then do it. Now that would make more sense. 
but there is no due process in civil forfeiture. They just take it and then you have to hire an attorney to go and fight for your own money back. And so as soon as you hire an attorney, you, you've already start losing some of your money. And you know, if it's not a large amount of money, the legal fees could consume uh, what was stolen uh, legally uh, from you and, and then some. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, Representative Finney's trying to change that now, and I, I give her great kudos um, for doing so. But her bill uh, got put over into the Judicial Council for review. And, you know, although a lot of bills go there and die, I think this one might have a, a real uh, chance of coming out with some meaningful reform. Uh, because we, we can't, the, the civil forfeiture laws, because of civil case, the burden of proof is preponderance. 51 percent, rather the criminal statute, which require beyond reasonable doubt. And Justice Thomas uh, weighed in on a case recently that, um, about a, they decided not to hear the case. Uh, it was a great opportunity for them to go into it, but he even uh, wrote a part on this uh, refusal to hear the case uh, about, you know, it troubles him that there is the denial of due process when the p government takes your property, takes your money, and like you said, some cases uh, there is no charges ever filed and they're reluctant to give it back. He says in this editorial that the federal government made $4 billion. Uh, I think it was last year in 2015 is when we got the last records available. And uh, the state government does the same. Carl, in your experience uh, in county government, did Sedgwick County have a lot of these assets they gained that way? Well, we, had, we have, um, we operate under the state law in terms of how the criminal justice system was here and we had some discussions on it where Sheriff Easter and our district attorney Mark Bennett came in and discussed an overview of the issue when they strongly support, supported the idea. The question I'd like to throw out to you is a variation on my first question. Most of the cases I've heard about on civil, asset, civil asset forfeiture have been federal cases. Do you have any idea in terms of how this breaks down either in terms of the number of cases the amount of money involved here in Kansas between federal cases and state cases? Well, I understand that uh, the state uh, is not required to report or record that in, in a single document. And I think that's one thing that the bill asked for for reporting, wasn't it? That's mm -hmm. right. You know, if you're going to steal this money from citizens without the benefit of due process, you ought to at least be recording it. And I think it comes into a, a a slush fund for law enforcement to buy things they couldn't normally justify under uh, their budget. Mm -hmm. And you know, if it's such a good thing, then they ought to be very open about the money they took it from and, and, and who and how and why and, and so we can do research to figure out does this need reform and if so, what kind of reforms can we use? Let me ask you because you've mentioned a Kansas Judicial Council and the legislature would refer this to them. Is this something appointed by the legislature, by the courts, or, or and, and to who, who's on it, and how does it operate? Well, uh, from and what, what I, authority do they have? From what I know, the Supreme Court runs the Judicial Council, and then they people become associated with it either by appointment or by request, and, and they study the bill and the implications of the bill and, and what we could do, because just because you sent the legislature could come back worse, you know. So we want to actually put some reforms in there that that you know, lead the bill to, to, to some meaningful reform rather than just... Would these be prosecutors, defense attorneys, judges, some, uh, citizens? I think... I mean, there's some of the judicial panels that exist. I know the ethics panels up in Topeka right. for the judicial side. There are some non-lawyers participating. Mm -hmm. Is that true of the council? Now that I don't know. There, there should be non-lawyers in there because you get a group of... You have 10 lawyers in a room, you got 25 opinions. You know, so you know, we, we, it's having a non-lawyer in there that says, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. If it doesn't make sense to a non-lawyer, then it probably it's not going to make sense to anybody else. Well, and lawyers are a special interest group like anybody else, yes, and uh, the laws are not written for their benefit. They ought to be written for the benefit of everybody. So I would definitely urge there to be other uh, ones there. And you know what they say, no matter what their contribution society, lawyers could be an excellent source of protein, too. So. <laughs> One more commercial break here, and then we'll get back uh, with uh, Bob Weeks, Carl Peter, John Aquino, I'm there on Wichita Liberty TV.
Well, welcome back to our last segment of Wichita Liberty TV this week. I'm Bob Weeks with Carl Peter John and our guest, Keen Umber. So there's a lot of talk, uh, both at local and national levels, about criminal justice reform, which is a very broad topic, a lot of different uh, angles and aspects to it. But a lot of it, it seems to me, centers around the system is too harsh on the wrong people and we put people who don't really need to be in jail, we put them in there for long terms, they get mixed up with actual violent criminals, and when they come out, it can be even difficult for them to get something like a driver's license and other types of things that are necessary to reintegrate back into society. It is, and you know, presumably, unless you're there on a, on a life sentence without the possibility of parole, everybody in jail is gonna get out. And we have a great opportunity to retrain these people uh, while they're in jail with a skill that they didn't pick up in their earlier years, and knowing we're going to release them back in society. But, you know, budget cuts and everything, we, we've cut out uh, GED programs, we've cut out a lot of things. So when they get out of jail, they get a, a set of clothes and a little cash, and, and away they go. And that's not. Uh, that, that's not what we need to be doing. We need to put more money. It's like early uh, childhood uh, schooling. You know, that pays. Uh, great dividends and if they look at it like this way by retraining these people into trade skills uh, computer skills whatever that'll pay great benefits uh, if we do that but currently Carl you know. when you were on uh, the County Commission I know that the population of the jail the Sedgwick County Jail which was the a county huge issue yes. a huge issue and I think through your efforts um, you were able to actually reduce the popul the daily count or average on a while what is that related to this topic and what did the county do in that case well the county set to a whole series of programs together Bob because in 2009 we had some days where we had between 1700 and 1800 people in the sheriff's custody and interestingly enough some of them were convicted felons which is a interesting topic that will go beyond here but by the time um, January 2017 we were running roughly about 1,400 people in the sheriff's custody, which is still a significant number. But the composition, we had people who were either charged with or serving sentences. Um, that number had gone up, and we had a much reduced number of people who were awaiting trial. And we used pretrial sentencing. Uh, we used a day reporting and a variety of programs to try and work with people uh, who for whatever reason, we had a lot of problems with failure to appear. Mm -hmm. FTAs was mm -hmm. the nomenclature. They'd have some sort of often very minor type of offense, but if it didn't get resolved, a bench warrant would be issued. They'd get picked up on something up else, and, and then all of a sudden we've got a lot of people in the jail for that sort of thing. And, and trying to get those people and folks who frankly struggle, you know, gee, it's Tuesday, I'm supposed to be down at municipal court at 9 a.m. and uh, you know, they're not sure that whether it's Monday or Wednesday, I let know alone from Tuesday. from a fiscal standpoint, each prisoner adds incrementally to the cost, but many prisons are full or overflowing, and so when you get up to that level there, then people start thinking about, hey, we need a new jail or a new prison, and that's when the real money gets spent. Well, the real money, frankly, is personnel, but the county was looking at a situation where they were going to add 390 beds for the price tag of over $52 million. I mean, that's over $130,000 per bed. I mean, literally, you're talking about buying a house. A night, uh, that's, I think, above the median house price in Wichita. So. And so what we looked at doing, and the cost, like, for instance, in the pretrial uh, services program, we could have six or maybe even seven or eight people in that program calling in, occasionally checking in on a visual basis to make sure that they showed up for court. We didn't have this failure to appear problem. And these are, you've got to separate yourselves because we've got some real bad actors here in town, uh, whether they're awaiting a trial or their seriousness of their charge or they're a flight risk. And uh, they need to be held and that's what the bonding process does. But we were fortunate that we were able to try and get folks who, more minor offenses one way or another and work at other programs. Uh, drug court was a major 
program that I strongly supported, helping people turn their lives around, and, and there's some real success stories there. And Keen, I know in just about the one minute we have left, uh, when we hear criminal justice reform, sometimes people say, well, you just want to be soft on crime, but that's not really the same as reform, is it? No, no. Re reform is make sure we get the right person for the right crime. That we c Prosecutors can't overcharge in order to do the plea down deal and, and get a plea without trial, but also the reform has to include uh, the engine defense. That's how most lawyers are paid to represent criminal defendants. Uh, they put a cap on, say, a robbery case, $600. And this goes back to, you know, the $600 is going to be spent up and you're not halfway through the case. Uh, but they, they need to take those caps off and say the representation cost with the representation cost. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in my own practice, I make sure I call that guy two days you know, three days, two days, one day, that morning, you're going to be there because A, I'm getting paid for it. And Your B, client, you mean? Right, my client, uh, to make sure he doesn't, you know, fail to appear. And, uh, but that's uh, like all budgets, uh, a lot of pressure to put on. They take as much as they can, but they can't get more. Um, and I understand that's a budgetary process. Yeah, well, that's a fascinating topic, but uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time this week. So, Carl, thanks for uh, your co-hosting duties. And Keen Umber, thank you very much for appearing this week. It's Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV, but we'll be back again next week.